You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. Well, it's been a rather dramatic start to the year 2011. We've been witnessing unexpected upheavals in the Arab world. President Obama's health care legislation has been successfully challenged as unconstitutional in a Florida federal court. And the month began with a horrific shooting at a Tucson, Arizona supermarket, where a lone gunman killed nine bystanders, including a federal judge, John Roll, and a nine-year-old little girl, Christina Taylor Green and wounded some dozen more, including Democratic Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, who was greeting constituents at the supermarket, and who of course was seriously wounded by a shot to the head, but who seems now thankfully to be recovering. In each instance, revolution in Egypt, the challenge to Obamacare, and the Arizona murders, they've all prompted political debate and the political rhetoric that's underscored the extent to which the polarities in America today continue to harden. Nowhere was this more in evidence than in the political reaction to the Arizona shooting, where in a matter of moments, there were those who blamed conservative talk show hosts in general and former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin in particular for creating a social and political climate that led to the Arizona tragedy. And for some time after the event, the focus of media attention seemed to center on Sarah Palin. Well, one of the individuals to whom the media turned for input was a gentleman we've had the pleasure of presenting to you before, Benjamin Buddy Korn, founder and director of a group called Jewish Americans for Sarah Palin, a grassroots political advocacy group which you can learn more about by visiting their website, jewsforsarah.com. Buddy Korn is also the host of Jewish Independent Talk Radio, a weekly radio program heard on 990 AM WNTP in Philadelphia. And Buddy may be most well known for his work in helping CAMRA, Committee for Accuracy and Middle East Reporting in America, to gain a national reputation in America. Buddy Korn, welcome back. It's a pleasure to have you again. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Mark. Thank you. And to bring a somewhat different perspective to bear on these issues of the day, I'm pleased to welcome back Ira Foreman, who throughout the 1990s through last year was the executive director and CEO of the National Jewish Democratic Council, the Jewish voice in the Democratic Party, and currently the research director of the Solomon Project. And Ira, thank you so much for joining us again. It's my pleasure. Mark. A pleasure to have both of you. You know, buddy, it is somewhat atypical in the Jewish community to hear someone create a Jews for Sarah Palin group. Tell us how it happened. And do, the, do people normally say to you, how can a Jew, how, an, an Orthodox Jew, a caring Jew, somehow be supportive of Sarah Palin? Um, let me just say on a personal level, I was affected very profoundly, as, as many, many people were, by Governor Palin's acceptance speech at the Republican uh, convention. It was a very powerful moment. Uh, my wife and I were sitting and watching her. I have to say that prior to that, I was not really aware of her or of her reputation. And yet, um, the, uh, I was much more familiar with uh, Mr. Obama and his background up till that point. 
and uh, was very concerned about what I knew about him and uh, what uh, was coming out and what was not coming out in terms of any uh, serious investigation into his background, uh, his politics, his associations, and so forth. Did you the, consider the, yourself a Republican at the time? Yes, but really a, an independent Republican, not a, a party kind of person, but a Republican-leaning person and a registered Republican. If you were leaning Republican, did Sarah Palin's nomination make you more enthused about the McCain nomination? Oh, yes, absolutely. But not because I was looking for McCain to uh, nominate someone who was considered a conservative icon to be on the ticket. I was impressed with her personally. And then when I began to learn more about her and look into her background, I was much more impressed with who she was. And, and this was even at the same time that the media circus about her mm -hmm. and against her had begun to erupt. So one of the things that I discovered rather quickly was that up until the time of her nomination, she had received in general tremendous accolades from the liberal side of the political spectrum and from Democrats and, and people uh, sympathetic to Democrats because when she was the governor of Alaska and even before that when she was on the two different oil and gas commissions of which she was an important part, uh, she had taken on the Republican establishment in the state of Alaska. When she became governor, uh, corrupt people of both parties, and in Alaska they were even arrogant enough to call themselves the Corrupt Bastards Club. People of both parties who had their hands in the till put on striped suits and went to jail. And this was because of her anti-corruption. So when she was governor and she was attacking uh, Republicans as well as Democrats, uh, she was viewed very, very favorably among the liberal commentariat. Once she became the Republican vice presidential nominee, things changed overnight. Yes, it became popular in the Jewish community to talk about her as if she was sort of a silly person and that she really had no substance. And Ira, I don't know what you experienced at the time because you were certainly very much involved in the Obama campaign from a Democratic perspective. Yeah. But I remember how it was, uh, the, the conventional Jewish wisdom was, Sarah Palin was not a serious person and as a result, her nomination for vice president, which would put her, quote, a heartbeat away from the presidency, weakened any interest in the Republican ticket. The first week of that, you know, her after her pick, I think there was some real question. She did a, you know, a magnificent job. I think I would agree with Buddy at the convention. Not, I didn't see the speech, but I saw pieces of it later. She was, she, she had was a riot. She was terrific. She was exciting. She was dynamic. Right. And she had that one line. What's and the one line? About the, a pit bull with <laughs> lipstick. <laughs> yes. Yes. Which was impromptu. It was off. Uh, off. Script. You think so? Well, I know that. I mean, that's been discussed because uh, there was a problem temporarily with the teleprompter, and she needed to go off script, and, and that was an improvised uh, remark, the yeah. pit bull with lipstick. Okay, yes. anyway, continue. One of the most vivid thing I remember is the Labor Day weekend after her nomination. Mm -hmm. I was at a party, a party for, like a birthday party, and about 20 or 30 leaders of the Washington area Jewish community were there. And people were active in Federation, et cetera, some other of the major institutions. And it was a very low-key, very kind of small, an elderly couple. And I knew probably most of the people in that room, but not everybody, but I, what I knew was half those people were Democrats, about maybe another 35% or 40 were independents, and then it was a small Republican contingent. And what really struck me is people just kept coming, coming up to me and saying, you know, I didn't know if I was going to vote for Obama. But now that he picked Palin, I can't vote for I him. I heard it all the time. And it was just wham. It really came out, and it was real. At that point, I said, wow, something's happening here. Yeah. And by the way, let me also remind our audience in general, I, I'm saying things people really should remember. There was the Gibson interview, which, and, and I say this now as somebody who interviews people all the time, she was sandbagged. It was a horrible 
display of journalism that Gibson pulled on Palin. And then there was a Katie Couric interview where Sarah seemed not to have credible, intelligent answers to questions which one would expect a, a uh, vice presidential candidate to have a more substantive answer. I have a background as a foreign affairs analyst. I did a master's degree in international relations. I trained for the U.S. Foreign Service. I followed these things. If somebody had said to me, just impromptu, what's your reaction to the Bush doctrine? You know, my question would have been, uh, specifically, what do you mean? Of course. Okay. So it was a chance to set her up and make her look as though she were unsophisticated in foreign policy. Now, I'm not saying that she has or had the strongest background in foreign policy of uh, a candidate at that level, but I think the same thing is also true of Mr. Obama. What I remember the Katie Couric interview was that she asked, what newspapers do you read? Right. And Sarah didn't have for what seemed to be a strong enough specific answer. And the suggestion, the implication was, Sarah Palin doesn't read the newspaper right. but, and isn't, but by the isn't way, up this on is, anything. This is somebody who has a degree in journalism. The other thing happened when yes. Saturday Night Live spoofed her, and the and, and the whole thing was that she, that she could effect. see she could see Russia from her porch, which she never said, but it did become sort of the quintessential who the heck is Sarah Palin? Right. At the time, the Democrats were very happy to make it seem like Sarah Palin was uneducated, sort of simplistic, and not sophisticated when it came to foreign policy. Well, I think we were certainly happy with the candidacy as it developed by, certainly by the end of September. One of the things we have to recognize is when we look at Jewish voters, Jewish voters um, have obviously some specific things like Israel they care about. But a lot of Jewish voters, on the average, and again, we can't take every Jewish voter and, and say that this is the stereotype, but on average, the one thing we know about Jewish voters is they're highly educated. And highly educated voters have certain types of expectations about candidates. They have certain ideological tendencies. And she played to a different um, role in American politics. There, are, there have been candidates historically, one of the founders of the Democratic Party, Andrew Jackson, uh, William Jennings Bryan, uh, Joe McCarthy, and I don't want to use the pejorative piece, but who played to the anti-intellectualism that does exist in American politics, that somehow these uh, professor types, these experts, are different than us, and they are somehow uh, don't respect us as a general population. And so there can be, and I think, I don't know if this is true or not, but at some point it may just have been that when uh, 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 Governor Palin had those problems and those things were rising, it, it, it made sense to play into that populist uh, because she was not going to, at that point, she was not going to add to the Republican ticket by appealing to intellectuals or highly educated voters. She might as well use that. And I don't know if that was, it was always a piece of it, who her political style is, because I don't know her Alaska style, but that type of anti-intellectualism, besides the positions on the issues, which, frankly, just the positions on most issues, just drove Jewish voters away. And I think the, com but I think the combination, it's not that she was that much more conservative than McCain on a lot of these issues. But the combination and the anti-intellectuals, I think just drew, my gut is, with that, but I haven't seen data, really did, worked badly for her in the community. She was being treated as a buffoon. Uh, Caribou Barbie, uh, all of these kinds of hideous uh, invectives that were unleashed against her. And by the way, it came out uh, over last summer, in the middle of 2010, that there actually was a conspiracy. And I don't use the word uh, lightly, and I don't look for conspiracies. There actually was a conspiracy of 400 journalists who were attached to a listserv known as the Journo List. This was published, uh, I believe, in July of 2010. It included big people like Joe Klein of Time Magazine and others who said they conspired on this list. It wasn't given a great deal of traction, but certainly in the conservative media it was widely discussed, um, that they said, how are we going to whitewash Obama and to destroy Palin? 
And I believe that at least a significant amount of the reaction within the Jewish community to Palin, the negative reaction that Ira is referring to, was just the same response that many Americans had to her being trashed in the media. A few, like me, said, you know, this is outrageous, but many just said, oh, you know, she is a subject of ridicule. She is a ridiculous person. And what has happened in the last uh, a year and a half is there are still people who trash her every day, and I think it's outrageous. And in fact, that I think is the reason that you contacted me about doing this program. But she has demonstrated that she is a person of tremendous political skill, that she has very deep appeal. And I believe that the reason that she is trashed constantly is because people, including the president, are afraid of her. Now, having said that, let me respond specifically to some things that Ira was saying about her appeal within the Jewish community. I don't travel inside the Washington circles, neither does Governor Palin. I travel among Amcha, uh, to some extent in the Orthodox community, to some extent among conservative and Republican Jews, to some extent among Democrats who are afraid and alienated about what has happened to their beloved Democratic Party that the progressives have taken over. And it's hardly discussed. I mean, we hear all the time about putative divisions within the Republican Party. Ugh, the Tea Party. Ugh, you know, uh, uh, all the candidates. Oh, Eric Cantor versus, you know, we hear about these things all of the time. We never hear about divisions within the Democratic Party, the progressives versus the old guard. Now, that has played out often when you're a program where people who I think represent old guard Democrats are shrying gavalt about what has happened with J Street, with the progressive caucus in the House of Representatives, 85 members of the U.S. House of Representatives who are avowedly socialists or socialist supporters. Um, what about the divisions within the Democratic Party? So what I'm trying to say is the main constituents who have I have been able to connect with in the Jewish Americans for Sarah Palin effort that we have put out have been Orthodox Jews who relate to her family values, um, conservative Jews who are interested in her, even if they have questions about her viability, and, uh, and alienated uh, Democrats and independents who are saying the Democratic Party has left me. Mm -hmm. They haven't left the party. The party has left them. I've not seen any evidence that there is a greater appreciation within the Jewish community that tends to skew Democrat anyway for Sarah Palin now than there was at the end of the 2008 election. We often feel on the, on the progressive or democratic side that things are unfair and that how the Jewish community treats things are often unfair. I mean, I, you say that, you know, it's all a conspiracy against Sarah. I can just give you a little insight. I didn't say all. No, but no, there, no. But I'm saying I, that there, it, you, there's a feel, it certainly is, there's a feeling. It's a conspiracy, yes. I, I, I don't want to use the word conspiracy because I don't, I don't usually, I think they're very rare. I use it very I, and advisedly I, you, you, and I clear, agree clearly you, you, yes. Clearly you said that. But, you know, I, I can, I, just the way Obama is treated on, the question of Israel within the community. I don't think the larger, broader Jewish community, but the organized community. I think there's sometimes real unfairness here. I mean, I, uh, I, went, I go back to the Carter administration and, and looking at how presidents deal with the U.S.-Israel relationship in the community. And I can give you quotes from President Reagan in his first term, from certainly senior President Bush, even from junior President Bush, certainly from Jimmy Carter, that you can't find anything like that, that uh, that's critical of Israel. Ira is suggesting that this notion that, that somehow Obama has not been good for Israel when compared to other presidents, including Jimmy Carter, but then a whole host of Republicans, that in essence, the criticism of Obama has been unfair. Do you agree with him? No. Why? There were three elements of the Obama treatment of Israel. No, actually, I should say four um, that I find have profoundly alienated uh, people who care about Israel, both within the community and, and, and non-Jews who are very interested in what we are doing. 
The first was his very ugly personal treatment of Mr. Netanyahu, uh, pushing him out the back door of the White House on two occasions, letting him sit there while he went and had uh, dinner with Michelle. Okay, that's one. Okay. The second is the fact that he has traveled uh, rather widely in the region, but, but has not gone to Israel. And since becoming not, president. Since becoming president, that's right. Three. And, okay. Third thing is his um, speech in Cairo, in which he strongly implied that the raison d'etre for the creation of Israel was as a reaction to the Holocaust, rather than to 3,000 years of Jewish history and our connection to that land. And the fourth, which I hear about often, was his visit with the king of Saudi Arabia, where he bowed to the Saudi king, which was considered untoward not only for an American president oh. to bow to a, a foreign potentate, let alone the king of Saudi Arabia, but in the Jewish community really disturbed people in their kishkin. Your response? Wow. Uh, where to start? Um, it, Historically, we as a community have looked, I think, very sophisticatedly at our politicians and how they treat the U.S.-Israel relationship. And I think, and, and we've really gone to substance. Uh, historically, when I worked at APAC in 19, starting 1977, when we looked at foreign aid votes, you know, you, you know, it was really easy to say, I'm a friend of Israel. Everybody said, I'm a friend of Israel. You looked at where the rubber met the road. Votes that were often in isolationist parts of the country for foreign aid were tough. Votes for arms sales were tough. Did you veto UN resolutions? Those were tough. What was your record? Now, rhetoric's not unimportant, but when also when you talk about rhetoric, let's talk about issues that are very, very specific to the U.S.-Israel relationship. And I'll be the first to say, buddy, please. Are you saying, though, that the treatment buddy. of the Israeli prime minister is in the category buddy. of rhetoric? Yeah, buddy. Because why? why? Because first off, you have both Netanyahu and Ambassador Oren said it never happened. So, and, and this has been well documented by the Israelis saying these questions of being slapped down never happened. Well, so, but buddy, I mean, if you don't want to believe the prime minister, if you don't want to believe the Israeli ambassador, oh, they're just making this up. This is thin gruel to say a guy's anti-Israel. Second point that you make. It's not for me to say he's anti-Israel. This is how people come to us and say, look at the way he treated him. Yes, I, you it, know, was, it, was, it was not insignificant that, that Jerusalem went out of its way not to make an issue of this. But go to number two. Yes, that's, that's the Number point. two, I, you know, traveling to Israel. I would like to see the president travel to Israel. But I'd ask you, I, don't, I may be wrong on this, and this is, is when did President Bush, how long did it take to, to go for President Bush to go to Israel? Was, did, we, did we hold that against him? Number three, speech in Cairo. You could take that, that there was, a, 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 it was certainly not clear. It certainly could be taken. But the other things he said in that speech were some of the most pro-Israel things any president has said. And for example, just on that issue, just this week, the president, through Gibbs, said that the PAs calling the Kotel a piece of, the, of uh, an Islamic site is horrendous, that it, it distorts Jewish historical connections, it, it doesn't hurt the peace process. I'd like you to see another president who's made that type of statement about Jewish historical claims in Jerusalem. So I think when we take these things out and bowing to the president, this pro here's bowing to the Saudis. Well, the, you know, I, there are pictures of President Bush. None of, none of us would say he's anti-Israel. We may have disagreements on policy. And by the way, I don't think everything the president did has done on the U.S. Israel relation is perfect. So let but, me give but you let, an let, example. No, no, let, let's finish here. Okay. Bowing to the president. Prime, the, president, prime, uh, the, 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 the king, king of Saudi Arabia. We have, we, have, uh, we have pictures of President Bush kissing the, the, the Saudi king. And, and hugging him and holding his hand and walking with him. So this is trivia, buddy. This is trivia. We have a relationship. But we it's have, not we, my criticism. It's what people well, wait say a second. to me. Well, and again, we have anecdotal. We will have evidence in 2012 whether how many people really think that this president's been uh, unfair to Israel or has been a bad president. We are in a recession that's the greatest recession since the, the Great Depression. 
presidential numbers in those times dive to the ground for Republican presidents, for Democratic presidents, etc. And I will tell you something. You made the mention that in the White House they're scared of Sarah Palin. They're scared like Br'er Rabbit was scared. Please don't throw me in the, in the briar patch. They want Sarah Palin. They would love to have Sarah Palin. Now, I will say this. If we are at close to 10% unemployment in November of 2012, Sarah Palin could beat uh, Barack Obama. But if our numbers are down, if unemployment is going down, it's like 8% or something, Sarah Palin is by far the best candidate from at least Democrats' perspective to run against. And I'm talking about talking to people at the White House, talking to operatives, et cetera. I'm scared as an American because I think Sarah is not, like many Republicans, is not ready to be president. But, you know, I was looking through the Internet, and I was looking on your website, to find examples, because Israel is obviously important for, uh, for us in this, in this discussion. Sure. And I wouldn't call Sarah Palin. I would be the last person to call her anti-Israel. But, you, you know, again. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but, no, it's, again, you have to, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a standard that we've historically used, and we've looked at a lot of specific things. We look at statements. But we also look at voting records, et cetera. And we also looked at the specificity of the statements. And we have, we have Sarah wearing you know, the, the pins with the US and Israel flag. I think that's great. When one of the first things she had, uh, she was being photographed, there was an Israeli flag, et cetera. But you, she has said that she believes that any building in East Jerusalem should, if none of our business, what, uh, what kind of building the Israelis do in East Jerusalem. That's about as specific, and I couldn't find any statements from your, your, on your website. Maybe that's not your purpose, but I was looking. I was Googling. There is almost nothing out there. I sat with the president. That Sarah has said about Israel. About Israel, about, to degrees of any specificity. Now, I'm, not, I'm sure she believes and she loves Israel, but there's, you know, you, for me, maybe it's not for everybody. Maybe it's good enough just to have it in your kishkas and you'll do the right thing. And that was one of the criticism of President Bush, uh, George W. Bush. But for me, being the smartest guy in the block is not necessarily making you the best president, but it helps to have some understanding of the conflict. I have been working in this stuff, and I'm not the biggest chokham in U.S. Israel relations, but I've been working on it since 1977. I know that the issues, at least as they go in Congress, et cetera, pretty well. I've gone through all these presidential campaigns. And I sat with Clinton, uh, Clinton with Obama, in a year after he was elected, with another 12 or 13 Jewish uh, chokhams, uh, around in, in the East Room in a, in a hour meeting where the, the only one who spoke was the president. And the president went through the history of the conflict. He went through the problems in the conflict. He went through American weakness, what America is doing. He took questions, and there were very smart people in that room, whether it was Rahm Emanuel, it was a Dan Shapiro, uh, it was, whether it was Dennis Ross, who could have jumped in. The man had amazing command of the details of the conflict. I can't believe Sarah Palin. I've never heard anything like that from Sarah Palin. And didn't have one mistake. Not one. And I would pick him up. Okay, buddy. Um, let me start with the business of anti-intellectualism. I think it's a complete uh, myth. I don't think that she is anti-intellectual at all. I think that she just does not have intellectual pretensions and that her style is a populist style. I don't see any element of anti-intellectualism per se in her persona, her statements, or anything else. She is a college-educated person. She has a degree in journalism. She worked briefly in journalism before she got into local politics and then on a larger stage even in Alaska. So the idea that she is somehow anti-intellectual, I think, is just a myth. And it is the same myth, by the way, that was propagated about Ronald Reagan, who got 40% of the Jewish vote when he ran against Jimmy Carter. So the idea that Jews are somehow turned off by people who don't have Ivy League degrees or who are not um, um, making intellectual pretensions I mean, Jews loved, I suppose, Adlai Stevenson, but he did not have a prayer in the earth of being elected. 
But they did love him. But they did love him. Well, okay. you know, he only he only got sixty percent against okay. Eisenhower. But what I'm trying to say is, I, I I utterly reject this idea that somehow Sarah Palin is anti-intellectual. What she is is a populist who does not have great regard for people who are full-time members of the professional political or journalistic class. People who feel entitled in the American system to the power and influence that they enjoy, divorced from the will and divorced from the sentiments of the American people. Okay. That's you would, number you, one. You would say, therefore, that if there are Jews who thought that in a roundtable discussion, Sarah Palin could not hold her own with some of the leaders of the Republican and Democratic Party on discussions of either foreign or domestic policy. Your instinct is she would have as many intelligent things to say as some of these other people. Yes, and not only that, but for example, she displayed in the few instances where she has spoken on the record about Israel and about Israel policy, an amazing sophistication and knowledge about what is going on there. And I'll give you an example, although I, I admit that she has not been on the record very much on these things. In September of 2008, she gave an interview to a small paper out of Englewood, New Jersey. She was at that point the, uh, the nominee for the vice presidency. Uh, uh, Susan Rosenbluth, who edits the Jewish Voice and Opinion, interviewed her and asked her what were her views about Jewish settlements in the West Bank. This was the question. And Governor Palin replied to her, oh, you mean Judea Vishomron? She re referred to the area by their Hebrew names. She said, that's a very interesting question. My understanding, and I'm giving this to you almost verbatim here, my understanding of the issue, this is Palin uh, speaking in the interview, is that those areas contain uh, many holy sites to Jews and to Christians and to Muslims too. And my understanding also is that it is only under Israel's administration that people of all faiths have had access to those sites. And I believe that we should take the issue of access very seriously. As an American leader, as a believing Christian, as someone deeply, profoundly sympathetic to the Jewish people. And by the way, not only on the issue of Israel, about which she speaks out constantly, besides wearing the U.S. Israel flags, pins, and so forth. She constantly refers to the United States as a Judeo-Christian nation, not as a Christian nation. You know, they try to paint her into the corner for a while as a Christian extremist, but I think that we, meaning Jews for Sarah, helped to put the kibosh on that. Hold on. Then also, um, when she has spoken about the Constitution, and after all, she describes herself as a constitutional conservative, not as a religious conservative, not as an isolationist conservative, as a constitutional conservative, which, as my good friend Seth Lipsky has pointed out, and he's written a book on the Constitution, is a document to which every American has a relationship, the United States Constitution. She talks about the antecedents of the Constitution in Jewish jurisprudence. So she is not somebody who is naive or unsophisticated. What I would say to you, Ira, is invite her, invite her to speak to a group of Jewish leaders about Israel and the Middle East and see the brilliance and the sophistication of this woman's mind. Part of the reason that we witness this nonstop media circus about Sarah Palin is because People who indulge in that want to distract attention away from the seriousness and substance of what she is saying. And the, the business with the reaction to the Arizona shooting is a case in point. She waited four days after the shooting to issue a statement about the attacks that had been leveled on her, on talk radio, 
Fox News, the conservative movement, the Republican Party, blaming them for what happened, the act of a deranged person in Arizona. She waited four days. And when she did, she released an eight-minute video in which she was speaking about the need in America for robust public debate, the fact that the Founding Fathers understood that we are imperfect human beings and therefore we need nonviolent methods through which to work out our disagreements, both in robust public debate and in our electoral system, which is, as you point out, the ultimate decisor of these things. She gave a very profound, nuanced response to what had happened in Arizona. And what did people do? They pounced on her, what I think, very legitimate, accurate use of the term blood libel, which you yourself said to me, Mark, you didn't know anyone who had been offended in the Jewish community, honestly, by the use. But I understand that in political life, political operatives will pounce on things in order to, you know, score points with their opponents. So, your successor at the National Jewish Democratic Council, David Harris, immediately jumped on her for having used blood libel. Jeremy Benami of J what, Street what did, did David, the same what did, thing. What did David say? Because I, re I just read that piece. And I know what he said. He said, it was, maybe she didn't know what she was saying, right. but historically, this is what it is, and we don't think it's a, a great David thing to wrong. do. Well, David was wrong. He may have been, uh, but, Mark, uh, you may uh, have been wrong, but let's, but, but uh, you know, David, but, but, but what, what there's has There's a bigger been, point been, here. But there is a big one. Let me, let me just make my the point. the bigger point. Okay, I just want to make my point. You know, sometimes you demonize other people on the other side, and what David said was, it was very mild, very mild, and in fact, two days later, when Sarah Palin said that she was getting death threats, David in, uh, put something out. I don't, the only place I saw it anywhere, maybe some conservative blog saying, that's inappropriate. No one should be threatening Sarah Palin. Hold up a vote to him then. Yeah, no, so I think, you know, it's not, you know, we demonize people. It's not purposely sometimes, and I'm sure I'm, uh, I, I do it as well. It's part of the block process. Yeah. We should be Demonizes careful. Demonizes a hair strong here. He was critical of him. If anybody was demonized in the process, it was Sarah Palin. Did you feel that but the, my the, you feel the Arizona murders were the fault of either uh, talk show hosts or Sarah Palin? No, I do not. Okay. Here's, here's what I do think. Here's what I do think. The rhetoric that's being used in the political process, and it's being used by both sides, but I will say much more on the right than on the left, but it is being used on really? our side. Yes. Uh, and the things like the, target, the targets that Sarah used, which Gabby Gifford herself said, you know, that does not, well, before the shooting, well before the shooting. Yeah, but it started by a Democrat, Bill Beckel, Bob Beckel. Well, Beckel, when he, Beckel put the targets on? Bob Beckel said he created the first map with targets and, on those areas and Bob Beckel, that he, Bob won, Beckel's it was wrong. a Democratic strategy. I, I, Bob Beckel's wrong. I have no problem okay, saying but that. You but, but, but hold on but a second. But nobody says that in the Democratic Party. No, we say. And instantly, I'm, I'm, not, actually, I'm not defending anybody I'm, here. I'm, I'm I am saying the, What bothers me I, is I, when I'm the story it. isn't told in its completion. I, well, listen, it, you know, in American politics, uh, uh, Mark, it is rarely told in completion. Exactly and right. And part right, of the right. game is, exactly right. part of the game is, is for how do you game it? And frankly, I, again, from my perspective, the right does this much more effectively of having just part of the story out. But let's go on. Let me, I need to, I would like to answer a couple things. Let's talk about um, why Jews do see her as anti-intellectual or at least see her as someone who doesn't get into details and, and takes positions that they think are where did she come up with that? Let's give an example. Climate change. Now, there are, there are people out there, there are a lot of Republicans in Congress say, climate change, we don't see any human uh, uh, re, uh, that agency, cause. Yeah, agency yes. cause for climate change. And there's a lot of them. Now, if you look at scientists, there are a handful of scientists who agree. But it might be a, out of 1,000 scientists, you might have 10. And that means that there's a scientific consensus. So what is the Jewish... Actually, the whole scientific Buddy, consensus that underlies climate change has been completely debunked. Not by the scientists. By Buddy, the scientists. No, it's not. And Buddy, you, hey, Buddy if you, if, when you say that, 90% of American Jews says, you're kidding me. Because let's put it aside now, because you and I are not going to solve that, although I totally believe you're wrong on that. Uh, but, uh, Buddy, let me speak. And, and Please, the Buddy, you've got to let me speak here. You've got to let me speak here. 
90% of American Jews says, that's flat earth stuff. When the stuff came out about books being banned, and there was this back and forth, did she really ban books, et cetera? But she was associated with that. For Jews, that's flat earth. That's buddy, true, but buddy, that's a false let me charge. continue. It's, it's not totally false. There's some truth to it. Third buddy, yes. I, her position's on abortion. I got to say, outside of, uh, outside of parts of the Orthodox community, and not even within all the Orthodox community, that stuff is flat earth society stuff. There's a whole series of, 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 of positions that Sarah takes. And by the way, she's not the only person on the right. It's one of the problems that the Republican Party has in appealing to uh, highly educated voters, to Jewish voters, and I think the Republican Party is going to come back more to the center because not just because of Jewish voters, because of, because of the American electorate will force it to do that to, because it's taking all these anti-intellectual positions, that taking these positions that, you know, when you have scientists, you have a thousand scientists and 17 say, I don't believe in earth science. Everybody else believes that, that it's true. And, and when the CBO, which for 50 years, both sides have not liked what the CBO said, but it's, the, it's one of the institutions. Congressional that, Budget Office. Correct. I'm so sorry. We know. Yes. When so we, you're inside the beltway. Right? That's exactly right. And, and my, my, it often means that I will have, as I said before, I get anecdotal stuff, and I don't always believe it. I need to see us, things that go on, go on, just like, you know, we all are, are, are subject to our own little circles. And so the anecdotal stuff is interesting, but it doesn't tell the story. But this is why. Sarah has such a tremendous problem with the American Jewish community. And to the degree that you can show her, whether it's in Jewish areas, and she can do it in other areas, of sitting down substantively with people. I mean, her speech in reaction to, to Arizona, it wasn't panned just by Democrats or liberals. It was panned by conservatives across the board and who weren't talking about blood libel. So it wasn't just a conspiracy. It was a bad speech, especially when it compared to the president. It was a brilliant speech, and it was a not, speech. Not for politically it wasn't brilliant. If she, did if, you listen to it? Yeah, I actually did. Okay. I and didn't think did it was brilliant. Think? I think it was compared to how the, the tone that President Obama set, it was, it was lacking. It was, there was a piece of it is about me, and, it wasn't, and that was not what it should have been. And, I, and the blood libel piece, let's put the whole point about there whether was, it's insulting there, there was or really not. nothing you know, in the speech the, the, that was about her, the, if you look blood, at it. The blood libel was, was at minimal. It was just using something that was, you know, heightened this stuff up and heightened the rhetoric up, and it didn't need to be done. It need, there was needed to be a healing time. It wasn't the right thing to do. And, I, and it's not just me as a liberal. There were tons of conservatives who said this. I'd like to respond to one of the issues that you raised here in particular which I don't think gets very much discussion and which I agree with you is a great deal of, uh, is of great concern to the Jewish community, and that is the issue of abortion. May I? Yeah. Besides the fact that she is personally a believing Christian and that she is ardently pro-life both in her own personal example and in who, and the organizations that she supports, let us look, and this is taking a page from you, Ira, at her public record as a politician versus anecdotes and, and uh, atmospherics. Governor Palin is a conservative tending towards a libertarian. She has said, number one, I myself am ardently pro-life, but that does not mean that my position as a politician is going to be to advocate, to dictate to the American people what they should do. Because her belief, of, as is well known, is that government, by and large, should get out of people's lives. Is there any question in your mind that if she could work out a legislative way to stop women from having abortions in America, she would not implement that? Absolutely, because Sarah Palin... You're saying she would not or would? She would not, because Sarah Palin... Sarah Palin does not want to implement an end to abortion in no, America. No, no, and I'll tell you why not. Because Sarah Palin is, in a very profound way, a feminist. And she does not want to see women having to go back into... Uh, alleys with wire coat hangers and all of this kind of thing. Well, Never. Yes, well, what's your sense of that? Well, this is a classic case where rubber meets the road. Sure. Um, Pro-choice voters, particularly in the Jewish community, they understand perfectly well what this all means. I mean, it's very, very clear. 
and all this other stuff about she's a libertarian and she'll let women do what she wants. Buddy, the bottom line is Sarah Palin's president. She appoints one or two or three pro-life justices. Roe v. Wade is overturned. And then two-thirds of the states ban abortion. That's the rubber meets the road. Everybody understands that. Two-thirds of the states, I don't think, are going to well, ban abortions. Mo I think we have to go, I, I first off. That's not an honest representation I think it, of I, what I, would happen. I think pro-choice voters do believe that's what will happen. And you can see the types of restrictions that are going in, that are going, pro pushing. Pro-choice voters might buddy. believe that just as they believe. Well, then, then, in, then in, you're in at, we were, we were talking, that's right. We don't believe in flat earth. We it's believe in the word. No, we believe it. Uh, the earth is round and, and, and reality is what it is. And the reality is. You a, believe in politicized no, the, uh, science that is not. That is the that biggest is, bunch of. Buddy, you're a smart guy. You're a really smart guy. And that's the biggest bunch of hokum I have, I have heard you come out of your mouth. I read that you're is, a smart guy. You you're also. a total hokum. This is, you know, if you want to argue with all the climate scientists, guys, go out and do it. But don't argue with me. The science is there. Also, Everybody guess, knows the science. Well, the you science are you are science. in the minority the of three percent. Stay on abortion. You're on the three percent of the American Jewish community. Stay doesn't. on abortion for a minute. Okay. The, Buddy is saying to you that Sarah Palin doesn't want the states she can to want, ban abortion. She can want what all she wants. I don't believe you're right. She can want all she wants. Believe you're right. What happens and what we anybody, all know what will happen. Anybody who really believes abortion is murder. Has to want abortion, to end abortion will end for much of the country. She did abortion not, will just end, and that's why pro-choice voters will not vote for these people. Look at her record while she was in public life. Look at her statements about abortion. She is ardently pro-life, but that is not the same thing as saying that there should be an end to all abortions. When you have another all Alito on. on the court, when you have another Thomas on the court, it's all over. It's all she wrote. A couple of states, like a Massachusetts, a New York, et cetera, will have the, uh, some ability to get can abortions. We agree, Most of these places will not. Can we agree that R. V. Wade is bad jurisprudence? I am not an attorney, and I would not agree to that. I do not know By that. By the way, even, if it, okay. even if it let's, were, let's even be if, honest. No, no, even if it were, yes. and I, I think it's very hard to validate a principle of privacy in the Constitution, it is obviously an interpretation. But at the moment, it, it does ref, represent and reflect what social policy is in the United States. And the question becomes, would Sarah Palin like to see that social policy changed, and what Ira is saying is she would appoint judges who would overturn Roe v. Wade, and then the whole game changes. I, I agree that the game changes. I do not agree that it is her intention to ban abortion. That is not true. It's simply not okay, true. Okay, I don't know what, I don't what, know what you're basing that on. I'm basing it on statements of hers, and I'm basing it on uh, what has been written about her by people who support her position. All I'm trying to say is this. Let us talk not about some nightmare scenario. No, no, listen, Ira. Let us be honest about what it is that she's saying and what the likely, as you, you like to say, where the rubber beats the road, what the outcome would be. What she has said is that this should not have been legislated from the federal bench by activist justices who are not in the business of interpreting the Constitution, but instead are in the business of legislating from the bench, and that this is a matter in the American system, in the system of government set up by our Constitution for the states to decide. Two-thirds of the states are not going to ban abortions. And here's another question. Here's another question. In the states where Jews live, where abortion rights are important to Jews, are those states going to ban abortions? Florida, and another question. Florida, and another Texas, question. Nevada, Arizona, another Pennsylvania, question. Another question uh, Ohio, I would like you to Wisconsin, answer. Minnesota, Michigan, Midwest, Minnesota, all these, all the, North, uh, the 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 upper Midwest, Missouri, all huge, the Midwest would what? Would would restrict abortions tremendously and and, uh, and many. You, but restricting is not. Banning. It will essentially partial mean it will. It, no, it will be go much much more over than partial. Ira, 
that two-thirds of the American people would like to see abortion restricted in America? Restricted? No, I, I don't. I'm because not Because you sorry. said two-thirds of the states would vote for restricting you, abortion. You have in two-thirds of the states now, and I haven't done the exact math, but I will, I'm pretty confident that it would, you have strong pro-life legislatures with pro-life governors who would restrict abortion, in many cases would ban it. But look and at wait the a second, wait a second, but the, the bottom line is here that m m women in America, pro-choice women in America, and, and that means 99.9% .9 of American Jew Jewish women, or maybe excuse 99. Me. Excuse Keep me. Keep going, finish this. Maybe set. 99, because the numbers are off the charts. Of the but Jewish women in your circles. No, no, I, the, no, no that no, answer no, questions. No. The because answer, you just said that to a large extent the Orthodox community is not on board about this. Okay. So forget about the 99 percent. Okay? I've seen numbers of 95 percent plus of, of women in the Jewish community, all women, all women, pro-choice, openly pro-choice, 95 percent plus. Maybe in your circle. No, not in circle. These are, these are numbers. You, this is not anecdotal. Mark, these people know what will happen. And there is this great strain in American politics of government anti-government but a piece of it is there's two different strains one is government stays out of our economic lives the other piece of that is government stays out of our social lives and right. our personal lives the democratic party as originally put together as a populist party under jackson and jefferson believed government should stay out of both spheres the change came 100 years ago the republican party became the party that says i'm going to restrict you in your personal life but stay out of, but we'll make them stay out of your private life this is a strong strain in American politics, despite uh, Sarah's libertarianism or the libertarian strain among some Republicans. This means abortion, the access to abortion for most American women will be t very, very, very limited. And they are not going to, and pro-choice women, and that means Jewish community women, are not going to vote for a candidate. And it's not just Sarah Palin, but Sarah Palin on this and other issues is like, is perceived as maybe fairly or unfairly, when, on things like climate change, uber, an uber conservative. All right, do we, have I heard there is agreement between the two of you that the way in which Sarah Palin was blamed for creating a climate in which the Arizona murders took place, that that is an unfair charge? That she was responsible? I, yes, I think that's an unfair charge, that she was responsible. I think that the rhetoric that lots of people used, include Sarah, includes some pe people on the right, we need to examine that. It's not helpful to America, but it didn't cause this shooting. Okay, and you've also said that you're critical of the rhetoric on both sides. Yes, I think sometimes on our side as well, although I do think it's more on the other side. Okay, Much so, okay, more. Okay, conservatives believe it's more on the liberal side. Be that as it may. I don't may, think that's actually true, but that's, we'll go you, ahead. You think most conservatives I, think that the rhetoric is worse on the conservative side? I think when you see the attempts uh, to regulate some of this stuff, you see much more Republican opposition to it than you do Democratic. I just like to. Were you upset when the when the here? when the Democratic congressman made a reference to Steve calling Cohen? somebody sure. and, and Nazis? And NJDC condemned it immediately. Yes, yes. Uh, it it just is amazing to me. You know, as somebody who who tends to lean liberal, I'm much more upset when liberals are at fault than when conservatives are at fault. I don't like either one, but I I take it personally when someone who is a liberal goes off the deep end? Well, you know, we pride ourselves historically, I'm not there, I'm not on the board now, but we at NJDC pride ourselves historically to criticizing both sides. Now, I'm not saying it's totally even-handed. We're a partisan organization. You know, we, we sometimes will wink a little bit if things on the border with Democrats. But when Democrats say something, whether it's this type of rhetoric, Nazi rhetoric, uh, whether it's the questions of blood libel, whether it's the questions of just calling their opponents things that, or saying things that are just lies, we just got to say, hey, Democrats make mistakes too. That is wrong. Good for you. I want to ask the, the two of you to just make some brief comments on these other issues that are confronting us and which are in the news all the time at the moment. First of all, Ira, what's it mean that Obama's health care legislation is now being called the constitutional question? Uh, what it means is that some conservative judges, two conservative judges on district courts, have ruled that as such. And what essentially that is a reflection of is the 30 years in which Republican presidents have gone out of their way to make, to make uh, a, a, this, what we're, we've been considered 30 years ago, very radical 
uh, judicial uh, appointments, and these people are reflecting that. And the bottom line is either the Supreme Court, in a fairly large majority, will say this is constitutional, or you will get a very radical, much more radical, I think, ultimately, than Roe v. Wade, change on the court by Kennedy's key vote. And if Kennedy, I mean, you have, there'll be four votes that saying this is constitutional. The question is whether the other conservatives on the court will go that far. And I think, though, it's not of the order of Dred Scott. The Supreme Court has problems when it takes positions that are so radical and antithetical. And, and a position like this, particularly if it's fairly broadly drawn, really takes the court back to the pre-1937 era. And I do not think the American people are going to want that. I think it's real, it's really classic judicial activism. And um, I think that, you know, ultimately- Are you against judicial activism? You know, um, I'm not sure that I am qualified to talk about that. I mean, I, I'm for, not sure. year, for years, it was I was brought up in the tradition that one of the things justices, especially Supreme Court justices, could do that was righteous was, in, in effect, force the agenda and move it forward. Right, right. And, and, and in the civil rights and in abortion, right. I applauded the decisions of the Supreme Court. Yeah. I'm surprised when I hear any liberal or Democrat now criticize an activist court. Well, here we have it. The Republicans courts and conservatives for 50 years have shried and shried about activist courts and have gone back to originalism, which I don't believe. And again, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not an expert on this, but I don't believe in originalism. And they shried over this and they screamed about liberal activists. Well, there is some hypocrisy here because they have now created a court system and, ju and, and judicial nominations who are overturning left yes, and right. Yes, the hypocrisy is on both sides. Well, the, if the hypocrisy, the, hypocr the original hypocrisy is we don't believe in activism, and now you appoint an activist judge and you applaud activism? I think the hypocrisy is more on one side than another. I, not at all. It's, a, to the, it's exactly the other way. And by the way, but the, our, those who are, who are taking this position within the conservative court when we point believe, out, when believe we, they're being strict constructionists. They believe you can make yourself, Mark. You can make yourself believe anything. I mean that that does, I mean. I, when, yeah, but, but on the face is of it, it this, is, this is going to either win or lose. It? This is going to win or lose on the basis of whether this this legislation does or does not violate a constitutional principle, and is it legal? Is it constitutional? for the government to force the purchase of a product. I don't think it's that si simple, Mark. Because you don't think so? No, I don't think it's that simple. There, there are people that are going through their minds on this. Or th I, certainly politics goes through people's minds and public policy. Certainly their ideas of uh, what, is the, what the Constitution allows and doesn't allow. But it's also in terms of what? Uh, in, in terms of what? In terms of, you know, in terms of the Commerce Clause. Exactly. What, that's all it's, this it's, is. No, it's not all about this. Then because, what else is it about so, that I don't so, get? Here we have a situation when, when Roberts was being... Uh, Tell me what the other issue is. Here's the other issue. Justices believe, supposedly, Roberts said this time and time again, a starry, what is it it's called, starry, that you don't overturn precedent. You only over, overturn precedent with, it, with great, 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 great trepidation. Where's the precedent here? The precedent is 60 years of judicial, uh, of how the, the, the Supreme Court and the federal court system has looked at economic activity under the Commerce Clause. This takes you back to a court of the 19th century and early 20th century. You know, it's interesting. I hear very intelligent discussion from both sides. And both sides seem to make very strong cases. And the Supreme Court is going to be nine justices. Ultimately, it looks like it's four to four and then a swing vote. Not necessarily. I think that this is this is such a, re a stretch that I'm not convinced that all conser four conservative justices are going to go. So you'll be surprised if it's a five-four vote that favors Obamacare. You'll be surprised no, no. if it only wins by one no, vote. No, I won't be. I won't be shocked. I, 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 but I wouldn't. I, what I'm also saying, I wouldn't be surprised if it's six to three or seven to two either. Okay, and so we'll be we'll meet sometime in the next two years when this is decided. Right. I will be shocked if there aren't at least four votes that say the Obamacare is unconstitutional. At least four. Shocked. I'll be shocked. Okay. And we'll meet. You want anything now to this discussion? I think the pendulum swings back and forth. Certainly when Justice Brandeis was establishing 
a template for judicial activism. This was a time in which the uh, rights of the common person were not given very much uh, support within our legal and political systems. Working people, minorities, immigrants, and Brandeis was the master of introducing into the legal record volumes of social data and political issues relating to these things in order to create an argument at the highest level in the court system for the court going beyond the strict constructionist interpretation of the law. Much of this, I believe, goes back to Brandeis, who is, is one of my heroes. So I am not making a, some kind of absolute ideological argument for or against judicial activism. There are times when it was appropriate, and there are times in which it has been grossly overreached. You are wonderful. Both of you are wonderful. And I can't thank you enough for not only sharing the time, but for the, but the wisdom and the passion. And uh, Buddy, it's always a joy to have you. I hope you come often. I, I love you very, very much. You're always welcome here, and I hope you'll always thank come you, by the, I would to love share to. opinion. And it's so nice that both of you gave our audience a chance to hear something and a discussion you normally don't get to hear talk about the both of you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arvin. And those were the thoughts of Benjamin Buddy Korn, founder and director of Jewish Americans for Sarah Palin. And you can visit the website at JewsForSarah.com. And Ira Foreman, former executive director and CEO of the National Jewish Democratic Council, currently the research director of the Solomon Project. We hope you enjoyed hearing what each man had to say. And as always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to the ideas expressed by our guests. Please be in touch with me this week by email or by mail or by posting on Shalom TV's Facebook page or feel free to tweet us. I look forward to hearing from many of you. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD, and we thank you for your kind support.